here in Denver, Colorado, covering CPAC Colorado, found Kate O'Machane, frequent guest. We love her on NRA News. Kate, you wrote the book Divider in Chief. Hold it up for us, please. <laughs> the Fraud of Hope and Change. Guess who it's about? <laughs> Guess who it's about? Is it about the perceived loser of the debate yesterday? Oh my gosh, perceived. <laughs> Was that just a complete blowout? It was really, I'm now extremely excited about this contest. When, you know, a lot of people I talked to today, or, you know, and you see this online, people are saying, people are finally saw the real Barack Obama, uh, and you know, without the teleprompter, and who was finally challenged by a surprising Mitt Romney, I would say, who I didn't know would be, you know, would challenge him so much. Um, so in your book, how does it address that? And, and, and what, what did you see last night that, that's applicable to your book? Well, I saw exactly what Barack Obama has been doing for four years. He's been avoiding any substantive discussion of the issues or philosophy, and he's gotten away with it. I mean, the press, of course, has let him get away with it. But this is the guy who came in and said he was going to be the great uniter, bring us all together. But almost immediately, instead of talking about his ideas and what is different and why they're good, he just started to divide us as a country. Because that's what he does. His goal is to come in, just like as he was as a community organizer, come in, identify the enemy, stir the pot, ram through whatever his political agenda, whatever his objective is, without any substantive discussion. That's what he's done. So when he's confronted with ideas and with philosophy, both of which Mitt Romney handled beautifully, he doesn't know what to do. Because his whole thing, his whole shtick, has been calling Republicans and Romney racist, anti-working class, anti-poor people, um, anti-woman, of course. There's a huge war on women, just in case you didn't know about that. Well, but, do, you, do you know about that, oh, big old woman? That shocking. <laughs> Republicans are waging a war against me. Oh, my gosh. No, if there's any war against women, it's being waged by the Democrats. I mean, let's just call it what it is. If they're going to use this divisive rhetoric, let's point out the fact that women are suffering disproportionately under this administration. Same with African Americans. Same with Hispanics. The groups that he purports to be championing, because, of course, we need the government stepping in to help us because we can't do it on our own, they're actually faring worse. Young people are another terrible example, but it's true. Young people, for the first time in history, think their future is going to be less prosperous than their parents because their economic quandary is horrible. Fifty percent of the gra college graduates are not finding jobs. That's something that is stunning. But again, Obama doesn't want to talk about economic realities because he loses, both on the facts but also on the ideology. I mean, I thought Romney last night was great, talking about, look, jobs, or that's the number one way to get the economy moving again. You have more people employed, more people paying taxes, more money coming into the government. If Obama were going to be honest about what his vision is, he would say, okay, I favor redistribution, forced redistribution by the government, so we're going to put more taxes on the job creators so that we will take their income and spread it amongst the poor and the middle class. But he can't do that, obviously, because Americans won't buy it. So instead, he just says, OK, Republicans hate poor people. They want to put $5 trillion of new taxes on you guys, which, of course, isn't even remotely true. But he was busted on the facts last night. You know, you talk about uh, the first debate, second debates on foreign policy. Um, that could not be a worse time for this administration. Oh when you look at the absolute disaster in Libya, which we still don't know any of the details, really. Uh, when you look at the, the Arab Spring that has not uh, fared well for especially Christians and Jews. Um, you look at all the hot spots around the world. Um, if you were Mitt Romney or you were you know, advising him, what would you have him say in the next debate about foreign policy? I would specifically talk about Obama's radical international agenda. Look, Obama has a few goals. Number one, he said it in 2009 in Egypt, it is to promote Islam. It is to clear up misconceptions that the American people or that anybody has about Islam. He called it one of his chief responsibilities as president of the United States. That is a stunning thing. As opposed to building up America's image around the world, keeping us safe, no, it was to varnish the image of Islam. That is something that absolutely has to be pointed out. The other goals of Obama, and I sound like a right winger when I say it, but it's true, is to promote abortion on demand around the world and an acceptance of gay marriage. It's very bizarre because he's not concerned at all about the ability of a woman in Iran to set foot outside her door without a male chaperone, and yet he wants abortion on demand for 
all women all over the world. Seriously, let's actually allow women to have some basic fundamental decency to be regarded maybe as human beings yeah. around the world, yeah. but he won't even acknowledge that. He has never criticized Islam. He has never criticized the oppression, torture, murder of Christians, Jews, and women, and gays all over the world. Um, and he refuses to hold them accountable. And as a result, we have a conflagration in the Middle East because they know America is going to stand on the, stand on the sidelines, not stand up for what is right and good. I mean, look, we basically paved the way for the Muslim Brotherhood to take over one of our allies, Egypt. Seriously, it's a bizarre thing. And in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood and the president endorsed the designation of women as secondary, men as fundamental, women as secondary. And the president says nothing. And you know what a State Department said? They said, we're not going to let secondary issues and pet projects get in the way of our broader objectives. All right, you try telling the American women that Republicans are launching a war on women? I don't think so. Well, it's interesting to me, you know, you talked about Iran. Um, you look at a group like Code Pink, you know, re re you know, revolutionary women who are so supportive of Iran, but Iran just named 90 uh, uh, classes or 90 uh, majors you can't, that, that, that women can't take in Iran. The way women are treated around the world is disgusting, but when, when you look at a radical group like Code Pink and they support Iran and they don't want anything to happen to Iran, it, it really just it bo kind of boggles the mind sometimes. Yeah, that's one I cannot actually <laughs> explain to you, except that um, Iran and the radicals in America both have a disdain for our traditional fundamental values. Freedom, um, the rights of individuals, the rights of free markets to prosper, um, traditional values of marriage, one man and one woman. Um, of course, that is appalling to uh, the radical left here in the United States. So there's this unholy alliance that is formed between groups that differ on so much, but they're willing to ignore those differences on just basic decency issues um, in order to push through a, a, a bizarre agenda of tearing down the basic traditional values of the United States of America. It is boggling, but of course, when you mentioned Iran, Romney needs to talk about the fact that Obama has ignored their development of nuclear weapons and is doing nothing to stop it. That he's, he's antagonistic to Israel, too. He won't oh even meet with Netanyahu. God. What he's done to Israel, not just, and I mean, he is antagonistic, but he is completely pulling the rug out from under them, constantly lecturing them, saying that they are an impediment to the peace process, trying to actually make them go back on gains that they have made over the past 50 years. It is a stunning development that the president of the United States is literally turning his back on the lone democracy in the Middle East, the lone legitimate democracy, the only place where women don't have to walk five steps behind men. And I mean, you would think that this president would embrace that. And I just hope that American Jews really have um, a serious, serious great awakening. I know some, it's happening among some, but I, I can't imagine Jews supporting this president in the election. Last question, uh, you know, your book Divider in Chief, you talk about this president. If he were to win uh, a second term, let's say, uh, talk about, you know, for our audience especially, the attacks on the Second Amendment, what would happen to the Supreme Court justices, you know, when, when we're talking about 5-4 decisions in terms of gun rights, uh, you know, what would happen to, to the Second Amendment in a second Obama term? Yeah, well, they would be uh, directly targeted because this president knows that he could not have done that in his first administration. I mean, already when he was elected, you saw the sales of ammunition go through the roof because people assumed that they were going to lose their right to purchase. So I think you will see an unloosed leftism in this administration. You will absolutely see um, liberals appointed to the Supreme Court who are dedicated to taking away our gun rights. You will see the UN stepping up their efforts to force other nations to lose their gun rights. And you will see this president buying into whatever the UN wants. I'm really extremely concer concerned about his deference to international bodies, of course, his deference to um, dictators around the world as he bows and scrapes before them. But there will be, and you know what, it, everybody says, well, well, we'll take over Congress and we'll have that as a bulwark. This president has demonstrated he doesn't care about Congress. I have a chapter in my book called The Imperial Presidency. He just marches right around Congress if something happens that he doesn't like. He will do that 
in on steroids if he wins this next election. There will be no restraints on him. It's like he said to Medvedev, take back to Putin, that I have to be careful until after the election. And then I'll have my, more flexibility. Yeah, my constraints <laughs> will be gone and I'll be able to do whatever I want. I think it is incumbent on gun owners, on anyone who loves the Constitution, to not only get out and go to the polls, that is key, but to share with anybody you can get an ear, to share with them your values and your vision and an understanding of really how treacherous this president has been, not just in pushing through a radically left agenda, which is a huge problem, but also in going after the essence of what makes us great. Our differences bring us together. This president wants nothing to do with those differences. He wants to avoid the messiness of democracy and actually shut out half of the population he doesn't want to hear what they have to say. He doesn't want them engaged in the debate, and he wants to vilify them instead. We have to stand up for our rights to have a difference of opinion, our rights to be able to articulate it, and to be able to champion our ideas, because that's what our founding fathers did. That is a healthy and a good thing, and it's never going to happen under this president, so we need a change. Kate Obenshane, next time I talk to you, I hope you get out of your shell. Hold up the book one more time. <laughs> You're so shine retiring. Kate Obenshane, the author of Divider and Chief, The Fraud of Hope and Change. It's always great to have you on NRA News, and it's awesome to see you in person. Thank you, Kate. Thanks so much for having me, and God bless you, and God bless all your listeners for what you're doing. Thank you.